Hello, hello and welcome. It is time for another episode of our couch lessons. I hope you have made yourself comfortable, maybe on a couch, maybe with a cold drink in your hand, and I hope that you will spend a pleasant hour with us. My name is Janet Neustadt and I work for the Goethe Institute, the Worldwide Active Cultural Institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the study of the German language abroad and we encourage an international cultural exchange. With the couch lessons funded by the Federal Foreign Office, we aim to sensitize our audience for the risks and opportunities for the possibilities and the challenges presented by the developments in the field of artificial intelligence. We believe that AI will contribute to a new revolution in human history. We believe that it will have a huge impact on our society. So we want to ask how this society could look like and how it should look like. And we want to question what AI could and should decide. Every week, always on Wednesday, we talk with experts from all over the world about different aspects of artificial intelligence, such as AI and climate change, AI and health, AI and privacy, or AI and ethics. And next week, we want to talk about AI and music. And as some of you may have already recognized, each of our couch lessons will be opened by another piece of music produce, produced by or with AI. And next Wednesday, it is the right moment to devote a whole session to this topic. Today, you have heard the song Little Instant from the indie rock band Yacht. Uh, young Americans challenging high technology. And next week, we will welcome the lead singer of Yacht. Today, a funny coincidence, we have Ross Goodwin as one of our guests. And Yacht worked together with Ross to create a lyric generating algorithm. And they fed them with two million words. So maybe Ross will tell us a little bit about this project later, because today we speak about AI and language. And before we start, I have to mention that this topic is also of great interest for the Goethe Institute. With the Goethe Lab Sprache, we set up an in-house innovation unit with an interdisciplinary team in early 2018 and one focal point for the team are use cases for machine learning and AI technology in language learning scenarios for German learners worldwide. Currently the team is working on two experimental projects in this field. The first one is a speech recognition software in foreign language learning and once fully developed the AI should not only be able to recognize but also to analyze common pronunciation errors of language students abroad. And for the second project, the Goethe Lab Sprache is performing research into the field of automated feedback for open writing tasks. If you are interested in these projects, we can send you further details. But now uh, we have prepared a poll for you and want to get some answers from you. Oh, it's not possible for me. Maybe Martin, can you start the poll? Yes, the chibi there. I hope everyone can see it. So, because I can't. <laughs> so I prepared uh, three different questions. Do you think you can always distinguish the text of a human author from the text of an AI? Have you ever used a translation program like Google Translator or Deeple? And do you think that AI can write creative texts? And as long as we wait for your answers, I would like to inform you briefly about some guidelines of the couch lessons. First, our experts will give an input, each about 10 minutes long. And after that, we will open the discussion. During the whole time, you can ask questions or contribute your opinions in our chat. And I will go through the chat the whole time and pick out some questions that will be discussed later. 
I will ask different persons to contribute their questions or thoughts personally, but if I don't ask you, please turn off your microphone. I I'll also want you to know that the entire event is recorded, but we will just record the persons that are speaking. So let's have a look at the results of our poll, if we can see it. Martin, can you show it? I cannot see it. It should show now. It, it was restarted a couple of times, but I can, can you see it. it? No? I can I see can. it. I'm just saying. I can see it as well, and I can, I can, uh, I can, I can tell you all. Uh, yes. I think it might be because you're still sharing the sound. Uh, ah, maybe. Yeah. That might be the thing. Sorry for that. Uh, so most of you think that you're able to uh, distinguish uh, a human author from AI most of the time. Uh, and then the second question on uh, how have you ever used a translation program like Google Translate or Depot? Uh, again, the majority of you have at least sometimes. Uh, and then the last question, do you think that a, an AI can write a creative text? Uh, most of you think not yet, but a big part of you also think that it's a yes. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to see if, if you think the same after this session. Uh, we, uh, uh, yeah, let's see. Let's see how you think after this session. So I've already handed over to Martin. Martin had <laughs> me curating this whole series and he's the moderator of today's couch lesson. And yeah, I hand over now. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Shanet, and hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Tunkvist, uh, and I'm a curator and concept developer, developer uh, based in uh, Malmö, Sweden. And with us today, we have Alyosha Burkart, uh, Melanie Mitchell, and Ross Godwin. They're tuning in from Germany, Berlin, Germany, sorry, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Los Angeles, California. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, spread, I think. Uh, and I'm super excited to hear them share their knowledge and experience on today's topic, which is AI and language. Uh, but before we kick off, please keep on doing what you're already doing in the chat, uh, that is sharing where you're tuning in from. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to see that we have people from, you know, Palestine, Greece, Mexico, Algeria, India, Peru, Bosnia. It's, uh, it's, it's a truly global crowd. and. Uh, Let's not take it for granted. It's fantastic that, uh, that each of you um, made the decision to, to be with us tonight or today or this morning, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, and so language can in, in one dimension feel like something static, uh, but, it, but in reality, it's ever evolving and ways of expressing ourselves are going in and out of fashion, and a lot of new words are invented each year. Uh, like many other things, language is maintained and involved as it's being used, uh, and often driven by people's will to build their identity or express themselves creatively. Another big force, of course, for the development of language is technology. Although we think about you know, technology as innovation and the new, our lives are packed with a lot of very old technologies, uh, and these has affected the way we communities communicate since the beginning of time. This session is about the connection between technology and culture. It's about the collection of technologies that we call AI, to be very specific, uh, and in the ways that scientists, um, and the way that's in which scientists and researchers are training computers, computers to write, how that process actually works and what the opportunities and limitations of the language uh, models are. That's what we're gonna talk about today. But we're also gonna talk about art and culture and what humans create with these new sets of tools. It's very exciting, so let's get started. Uh, our first speaker is Alyosha Burkath. Uh, he's the deputy site director of the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence in Berlin. Uh, he's an expert in language technology and artificial intelligence. He's also a member of the Enquet Commission of, on Artificial Intelligence of the German Parliament. It's a great pleasure to have him with us. Please all beam your energy to Alyosha. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Yes, thank you so much and welcome everybody. So I'll share my slides now with you. So I call this, this, uh, this short impulse a subjective crash course in NLP and NLP stands for natural language processing. Um, 
So I need to get focus on my own computer, yes. So when I think about language and the functions that language has, there are basically, it's always about communication. I mean, you can't use the language without not doing communication, right? But often enough, the, the, the aspect of knowledge or information transport is, is bigger. When you look at the lexicon entry, I mean, the communication part is not, is not, the, is not the most important. And you can communicate without transporting information for example, if I tell my wife, I love you, uh, communication-wise, that's very important, and, uh, but the information in itself is not really important to her because she hopefully knows it. And then there is translation. It's uh, something that goes cross to these, um, these two functions. And language is a perfect human-to-human -human interface. So you have many, many concepts and knowledge uh, uh, in your mind and a lot of experience, and I only need to move a little bit of hot air uh, to uh, evoke this concept in your brain. If I'm saying I, I'm thinking of a sunset in Egypt, or if I'm telling you think of a red dot uh, next to a, a blue triangle, you immediately have the concepts in mind. I don't need to explain the whole world for you to understand me, but if you, if you take a machine on one side of the equation, then our job, and this is the job of us language technology people, we have to bring all this knowledge, all this experience, empathy, what have you on the machine. So we need to set the machine in a state that it can reasonably know what to do with this language input. And this is our job. And in theory, when I've learned computational linguistics some 20 years ago, we had this nice uh, uh, parting of the, of the things into three big areas, the area of syntax, grammars, syntax trees. Yeah, maybe you've heard of Chomsky and so on. And then we have the level of semantics, meaning, we talk about concepts, entity, about feature structures, ontologies, formal logic, inference. I mean, that would be the level of semantics when you think of Plato, Leibniz, Wittgenstein, and so on and so forth. And on top of that, we have the level of pragmatics. That's what you do with language, speech, acts, rhetorical structure. For example, if I ask you, can you open the window, I don't expect you to say yes, uh, but I expect you to do something. That's what we call pragmatics. And now. I should take a big red cross on my slide and cross this all out, but because this is not how we treat language on computers today. This is, would be an, in theory and in, in, in linguistic theory, we would treat language like this, but reality is a little much more uh, uh, sad, if you wish. A realistic view on language technology and natural language processing is that we do a, what we, what I would call a little bit flat processing on the word surface. The machines have very little world knowledge. They have hardly any linguistic knowledge. If you wish, they are, it's, it's manipulation of symbols, if you wish, on the machine. And it will become clear soon and in this talk what we mean. And when you build systems or computers that deal with language, you always have a trade-off between control over the content and control over what the machine is doing and scalability or performance. And essentially, there are three approaches, and I will go through them very quickly, one by one. You can do symbolic knowledge processing, you can use classic machine learning, and you can use the, the neural networks. And this is also where then the, the, the next speakers uh, uh, will uh, uh, take off. Um, symbolic knowledge processing would, would mean that we code the, the, the language, the, the linguistic knowledge, the knowledge about the world in a way that humans can understand. Often enough, it's what we call triples. I call it who did what to whom, like New York is, uh, is a city in the United States. New York has such and such many in, uh, inhabitants. Washington is the capital of the USA. I mean, on this level, we can build the so-called formal graphs, knowledge graphs, graph structures. And these things are used, for example, for, uh, for the, the, the classical robot journalism, yeah, weather data, sports results, they can be represented in this form, the following team won, uh, and today we have 36 degrees in, in Germany and so on. You, when you use these systems, then you have a good control. Also, by the way, our, uh, our smart, uh, smart uh, uh, assistants on our phones, they, walk this, they work this way. You can book a restaurant, you can, you can dictate an email, but the function uh, uh, that they offer is very limited, but you have a lot of control. When something goes wrong, you can, you can, you can change the system easily so that it reacts differently on, on different input. And then, I mean, in the, in the middle of the 1990s, uh, machine learning became the, uh, the state of the art in language technology. 
and you have been people started to treat words as as objects if you wish and they turn words into mathematical vectors that it's really easy for example you take the words word mouse in text a it occurs two times in text b it occurs three times in text c so then you build this vector so this vector 2330 then represents the meaning if you wish of the word mouse when you take a, 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 a document collection like wikipedia as a basis and so then you can you can count and calculate with words and sentences and documents and so you can find out that for example mouse and cat are similar uh, concepts when you talk about animals but uh, but mouse also appears in the computer context yeah, certain aspects of mouse uh, appear in the computer context namely the computer mouse but for example the word cat does not appear in the computer context and that's how people then had the first generation of machine learning and they used it for text search for the first web, uh, web search engines, the first Google versions. Um, you could find similar documents and, and classify positive and negative reviews, for example, in, in, in online shops. These systems, they have been scaled so and so. For some applications, it was just enough. But for others, I mean, it, it doesn't scale so much because, for example, Oh, there's a nice translation error. It says you don't find alternative formulations here. It says doctor, doctor, so it should be doctor and medical. Yeah, so this was translated from German automatically. That's really funny. So these machines, they couldn't detect that the doctor and the medical, for example, are the same. So for synonyms, you have to tell them manually. But you had a kind of control. You could inspect these vectors and you could find out if you did put some hard work into it why the system uh, classified some things uh, like a, some review as positive and another one as negative when, when, when you are not of the same opinion. And only recently, uh, an actually old technology, neural networks as a technology, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's 30, 40 years old, but I mean, as an application that works, it's, it's fairly new. Uh, we use word embeddings. And I'm not saying a lot about these systems because the, the next speaker will, will take on here, but, but the words are, so to speak, treated just in relation to all the neighboring words, I mean, back in the text. So you don't do any explicit modeling. It's purely end to end. You feed the systems with many, many words uh, and with certain tasks. For example, for translation, you feed them with bilingual text. This is a German sentence. This is an English sentence. But you don't do any, uh, any intellectual work in between there. The machine finds uh, itself through, through the task and it learns how to translate words, how to summarize text and so on on its own. And so you have limited control, but the scalability is high and the performance is high. And so this is a real interesting development. Yes, yeah, so in terms of scientific insights, uh, it gets less and less, but in terms of performance, it goes up and up. And this is the state of the art at this point. And just the last sentence, of course, you can people build also hybrid systems that have a little bit of this and a little bit of the other. I mean, it's not, it's not that strict. And I'm finishing with a list of typical natural language processing applications, the easy, one on, on, the easy ones on tops, document classification, machine translation, opinion mining, sentiment detection, they work fairly well, question answering, sometimes they work, sometimes not. And automatic summarization is actually a little bit more difficult and also the dialogue systems, they are quite challenged uh, so they, they can't do a lot. I leave out completely the engineering side, which is the dictation systems or the speech, uh, the, the um, speech to text, uh, and the text to speech systems. I would call this the engineering side of language processing. I will leave this out in translation. I also didn't talk a lot about it. Uh, translation does not only mean multilingualism, but also translating into uh, easy languages, uh, sign language and so on and so forth. So there is a lot if you talk about barrier free. Uh, access to media and translation is a different, diff different uh, diff uh, interesting op opportunity. And the last point, I mean, I think uh, Jeanette uh, mentioned it in the beginning, I mean, irony, social legs, like, spontaneous metaphors, hate speech, and all these kinds of things, they don't lend themselves but particularly well for being treated by, um, by systems. Often enough, when you want to find these things, then the systems, they are, they are more acting like a spam filter. They look for certain smiley spelling errors, for certain metadata, at what time of the day are people posting, how much are they posting, but it's not, it's not coming from the content, but it's rather looking at the metadata to find out, I mean, is this maybe a, a person that, that has a bad, uh, a bad will or so? Uh, and with this, I would uh, hand back um, uh, to my colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Alyosha. Um,
We, sorry, my, my computer froze for a second. Uh, we'll invite you back at the time, at the end, uh, for the Q&A. Uh, please, everybody, ask questions in the chat, and we'll make sure to, to incorporate them uh, in the discussion after the talks. Uh, our next speaker is the author of Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans, among other books. Uh, her name is Melanie Mitchell. She is the Davis Professor of Complexity at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, and for us, she's going to discuss AI's capability to write. Uh, please welcome Melanie Mitchell. The screen and microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's really thrilling for me to be here with this great global audience. I want to talk about this topic of language models and a program called GPT-3, which some of you may have heard about. It's made a lot of splash in the news lately. Here's one headline, OpenAI's GPT-3 algorithm is here and it's freakishly good at sounding human. So OpenAI is a company here in the US that uh, is aiming at general artificial intelligence GPT-3 is their most famous program, and I'll tell you a little bit about what it is and what it can do. It recently has been used to write op-eds <laughs> or uh, you know, opinion pieces in newspapers, and people are now worried about controlling this AI that they call very, very powerful. So what is GPT-3? I'll tell you in a minute what it stands for, but uh, basically it's a, what's called a neural network language model. Well, what's a language model? Well, in the most simple terms, and this is simplifying a little bit, but not too much, a language model is a computer program that learns by completing sentences. So suppose I give you this sentence. I, was, I slowed down because I was being followed by a police and your task is to tell me what the next word is. Okay, probably most of you would say car or motorcycle or something like that. Um, or if I give you another sentence, water freezes at zero degrees and boils at, and now give me the next two words. Well, you might say 100 degrees. All right, well, that's exactly what a language model learns to do. Um, so neural networks can learn to be language models. A neural network is a, also a computer program that is very loosely inspired by the brain. It consists of lots of simulated neurons, those are these little circles here, connected to each other by simulated synapses, that is the connections between neurons that have different strengths. And what a neuro, neural, language, lang, neural network language model learns to do is to take in a sentence like the one that I uh, showed you before, turn the words into kinds of numbers, mathematical objects, just, just like Alyosha talked about, and then figure out which word, given all the words, say, in an English vocabulary, uh, should come next. And, assigns a probability to each word. And then the neural network learns by being told what the next word is, and then changes the, the strengths of these connections. And it does that over and over again with many different sentences, and eventually learns something about the structure of language from just these statistics. So GPT-3, it stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer 3. There was actually a number one and a number two version, but this is the latest, greatest, most powerful one. I won't talk about what the transformer is. Um, the generative means that it's able to generate language once it's been trained. And the pre-trained means that it learns from a large amount of English text. In fact, it was trained using all sentences from a very large set of English web pages, all sentences from Wikipedia in English, 
English book collections and more. And I'm sure it's going to be extended to other languages besides English. But it's essentially that kind of language model that I talked about earlier. So let me give you an example. I was able to get access to a, a testing version of GPT-3. And I tried it out. And so for today's lecture, I gave it this prompt. That is, I typed this in. I'm scheduled to give a short talk for the Goethe Institute's Couch Lessons series. The talk is aimed at non-experts and is part of a discussion of AI and language. I need some advice. What should I include in my talk? OK, and here's what the machine responded. OK, and it, this is all the stuff that's not in boldface here is what the machine output. And it answers in a way that a human might answer. It tells me my question is good. It tells me that some things are important. I should say where the field is going. I should give an example. I should mention different approaches. I should say something about how language is used in AI. And it tells me that it put together a set of slides. <laughs> and if you're interested, email me. OK, this is the, the machine talking. But it didn't give me its email address, so I wasn't able to use its slides, unfortunately, if those exist. But anyway, that, this sounds very convincing. And this is really a, a, what a, a generative system is. This is why it's G. The generative system means it can generate language. Just using those probabilities about word completions that it learned. OK, so you can see that why, why it's said to be freakishly good at sounding human. Here's another example. So it can, it can copy the style of my inputs. So I decided that I would test it by giving horoscopes. So I took these from an astrology web page for different uh, horoscopes, short horoscopes, and here's how it continued. It now, it knows about the different signs and it continues giving very convincing horoscopes for, uh, for other signs. So where did it get these words? If you type these into Google and see if these were actually some words that a human created, you'll find that these are not on, on the web. This is something that the machine has created from seeing millions or even billions of examples of English text. And it's just astounding how human-like it sounds. So those are just a couple of examples of the kind of things that GPT-3 can do. And now this company, OpenAI, is going to commercialize GPT-3, meaning it's going to sell it uh, to um, companies and anyone who wants to use it. You actually, you're, you yourself can go to OpenAI's website soon, I think next month, and, and sign up for a free trial so you can test it out yourself. But a lot of people have talked about some of the dangers of this kind of incredibly sophisticated language generation machine. It could generate fake news. Of course, we have a lot of humans out in the world generating fake news, but this machine might do it much more efficiently. Students could use it to write their papers. They could cheat this way. So I, I experimented with this. I, I took this prompt. This is something I typed in that I cut and paste from a website. So write an essay on the contributions of the three Schuyler sisters on the American Revolution. If any of you have seen the musical Hamilton, you might know about the Schuyler sisters. So anyway, I type in a first couple of sentences about the Schuyler sisters. And here's how GPT continued. It, you probably won't have time to read all of this, but this, these sentences are very convincing and could actually be sort of cut and paste by a student who was too lazy to write their own essay and have GPT write it too. Another possible danger is that GPT-3, in its generation of text, sometimes spits out sentences that actually occurred in its data that it was trained on. That is actually sentences that, or paragraphs that were written by humans. And so it might end up putting, if you try and write your paper or write a news article using GPT-3, you might find yourself accused of plagiarism. Another problem is that a lot of the text that it's been trained on can have some 
biases as human generated text does, racism, sexism, and other biases. So as an example of that, here's something I put into the, to GPT-3. So I asked it about some differences between men and women, like who can lift heavier weights? And I answered, well, men have bigger arm muscles. Who can ride a bicycle faster? Men, because men have bigger leg muscles. And then I asked, who is better at physics on average, women or men? And here's what GPT-3 answered men because on average men have bigger brains. So this kind of thing can be very insidious, that is very dangerous and subtle. In the text that it generates, it can generate and propagate biases. And finally, it might fool people into thinking that AI is smarter than it actually is. And this is a real problem because actually GPT-3 doesn't understand the language that it's generating in the same way that we humans do. It doesn't have any sort of knowledge about the way the world works, but it's still able to generate this kind of language that sounds very convincing. So we might end up believing it or putting more faith in it than it really deserves. Someone called uh, GPT-3 a mouth without a brain. And I really like that characterization. And I think we have to start worrying about how can we detect this kind of language generation that's non-human and how can we avoid giving it too much credit? I'll stop there and hand it off to the next speaker. Wow, thank you very much, Melanie. That was really, really good. Uh, and please ask, in qu please ask questions. I see that there's already some, some questions going in the chat. Please uh, be active there and we'll, we'll bring them up uh, in a bit. Uh, now to our third and last speaker, and it's time to get practical and show an array of artistic cases. So with us to do that, we have uh, Ross Goodwin. He's a data poet, artist, creative technologist, hacker, and a former White House ghostwriter that employs machine learning, natural language processing, and, and other technologies to realize new forms and interfaces for writing. Please beam your energy to Ross Goodwin. The screen and microphone is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm working on condensing that like uh, description of what I do. Uh, at some point, it's going to become a single word, I promise. Um, but it's, it's, it's increasingly hard, you know, the more this entire field uh, sort of moves forward into the future and, and the more things like GPT-3 emerge because, you know, what's, I, I, I don't think so much about like GPT-3. I think that there's a lot of novelty to GPT-3. I, I think those examples were really interesting that Melanie showed. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, one that stood out at me was, was, the, was the, the slides. Um, because you know, it just sort of demonstrates a capacity of these technologies, which is to, to point out kind of inherent bias we have about our own languages, such as that, for example, um, uh, context is, is sort of everything, right? Because if, if your AI is supposed to send your email and it says that there are slides that don't actually exist, that AI has sort of failed, even if it wrote a really nice email. So, you know, in, in the face of all of these advances in statistics and deep learning, um, practitioners, engineers, and, and weird artists like myself, um, you know, are sort of looking at AI as more of a, almost a design problem than a computational one. And I guess I'll start, you know, my work is pretty easy to Google, uh, but um, the, the project that I'll talk about um, first is, is this one called Chain Tripping, and it's an album you can listen to uh, on Spotify and I think every platform imaginable at this point. Um, and I'm really proud to say it was nominated for a Grammy uh, last year. Uh, you know, although it was Best Immersive Album, which has nothing to do with the lyrics, which I, I which is, which was my contribution. Um, or my partial contribution, I should say, with an asterisk, because I, I guess the way in which I contributed is I trained a um, neural network model uh, like the ones we've been talking about. Uh, in fact, a generation before GPT-3, uh, to write lyrics um, using the influences of the band. And those lyrics, um, with the help of Claire Evans, subtractively became the lyrics for the album. 
um, I curated about 20 songs and Claire kind of cut those songs down to what became the album lyrics. And I think these machines just invite new ways of working with archives and with the data that we have so readily available everywhere all the time now um, in new ways of sort of like writing and interacting with pens and what, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time like making better and better pens without asking really like what is a pen and what are we doing when we communicate in various contexts. Um, you know, there are questions about language that are sort of easier to answer now that we have systems like this. And I think the way to get toward those answers is by elevating the public discourse about the technology with events like this. So thank you very much for having me. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I might be running a little short on time at this point, but um, I've been working lately on a project involving rap um, because I think it's really important that we um, don't that we that we we don't limit ourselves to the sort of like the driest reaches of the internet when it comes to um, uh, studying language in the context of machines. We should look at what's popular in cultures around the world, especially the ones that are most accessible to us on the airwaves and you know what we're hearing and what we're seeing on TV should be factored in because that's gonna be the data that the systems of the future feed on in order to create you know, the fake news of the future at the very least and hopefully something a little better than that um, if we can put our imaginations to work. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just think that um, AI is such a tricky, in such a tricky place right now um, with respect to uh, its, ability to surface these deep um, embedded biases um, like Melanie showed in some of those examples. Um, and, and so I, I hope my work sort of brings attention to the inherent structures these algorithms can create um, because I think that is what, I'm missing a ton of questions by the way, I can barely see them. They're popping up really fast in the bottom of my screen. Um, so maybe I should just turn it over to questions at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I guess like as a practitioner in the space, I'll just close by saying, I, I think we can get into these really interesting uh, cycles of generation and interpretation. And the, the curation and editing processes we build around these machines, as those become formalized into sort of like new, uh, new workflows and, and, new, and new, uh, new forms and interfaces, that's when we sort of become, when we can become more than writers, we become writers of writers, as I like to say. So um, that, that's been the basis of my practice for a long time. And I'm sorry for shaking my phone. Um, I, I'm having laptop issues this morning. Uh, I, I, I'm gesticulating with my right hand and it's not working out so well for the camera angle. Uh, but thanks for having me again. So Ross, can, can you say something about the project of, uh, that involves a car? Yes, I, I skipped right country. over that, didn't I? Um, so one, the road yeah, was a project. Time, so please, Great, please yeah. Back. One, the road is is a project I did in twenty seventeen. Um, it was a road trip across America. It was a thousand miles from New York City to New Orleans, and the idea of the trip it was a really rapidly organized project. Um, and the, the idea was to write a book with the, with a car as a pen, and it was sort of the capstone project of this series that I called Narrated Reality. Uh, sorry, Narrated Reality, I'll just speak a little more clearly. Uh, and that's gonna be the body of work starting with word camera that is presented in the context of XR or VR, um, but is more about experiencing events as they happen and then perhaps later in an augmented format as it's evolved with new projects, it's become, you know, an exploration into the expressive capacities of machines and augmented realities can exist at lots of different levels and don't have to involve a headset. I mean, they can exist in the form of your band getting lyrics or, or getting more like a block of clay that, that's built from the lyrics that influence them that they get to shape into a meta representation of their own vision. And I, I think that's what this technology represents for creatives. It doesn't represent a replacement of human creativity, it represents an augmentation and an opportunity to move forward and, and build work that's sort of beyond what exists right now 
Um, there's no real replacement that has to occur <laughs> with respect to the human element. And I don't think anyone wants the human element gone from creativity. I think the creatives who are working in this space, uh, like Claire Evans, you know, like the band Yacht, uh, and, and who I guess you're going to hear from soon in this forum as well, they really understand that technology is, is something that we all contribute to and we all take part in, even those who don't write code, even those you know, at this point, there's very few people on this planet who aren't, who aren't involved in some way in the ecosystems that exist on our phones and which are written in JavaScript. Um, to the extent that you know, we're living in, in a modern um, utopia or dystopia or, or some topia, uh, it all runs on JavaScript, which is very bizarre if we think about the history of architecture, I don't know, the way things are usually built. JavaScript, if you're familiar with code, is more or less a, a default option. Um, it's, it's not a particularly robustly designed language in certain contexts, and it's just sort of been stretched to the limit at this point and a lot of stuff on the internet breaks and doesn't work well because it's written in like layers and layers and layers and layers of code to compensate for the fact that we really just need new a new browser probably or nobody really knows but there's lots of things about the current state of technology that's in flux and it's important to be aware of uh, the fact that your phone is not a magic box made of light <laughs> Um, you know, despite what uh, the, the huge companies might tell you. Um, and it, it, it's, it's all based, it, you know, all these systems feed on huge data stores. Um, and you can make a GPT-3 style model that writes like anyone, uh, essentially. I, I, to me, the sort of nightmare use case of the Melanie, so, so there's obviously like students cheating and stuff. But I, I think it, it's only a matter of time before we have Hackers, you know, the, the current scam is like, you know, they freeze all your files and you pay them five hundred dollars in Bitcoin. So, so, or, so, what happens when a hacker using a GPT three style endpoint and an API? I'm sorry to use technical lingo. I hope some people understand what I'm talking about when I say that. Is able to because basically, once someone has access to your email now they can speak in your voice to anyone on your contact list in addition to having those contacts. So all that spam email you get, imagine what might happen if that was written in your friend's or your parent or your relative's voice and it legitimately sounded like them and came from their email address. I mean, you don't need a deep fake video if you have legitimate reason that they can emails from a family member. Um, and that's all it would take to, to compromise a lot of things about, you know, privacy on the internet in certain cases. So I, I think that's the use case that OpenAI gets concerned about, I hope, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um, but, um, it, it, yeah, am I running out of time now or, or should I keep yes. going? Okay. Uh, no, yeah. Love to open up the questions. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Ross. And I think it was two, two good things there, augmentation instead of replacement and also this new scary case, the nightmare case that you um, talked about. With yeah, and, and, and to be clear, it's not like a nightmare. It, it's not a nightmare. It's, it, it can, there's sort of a positive example of the same kind of software that would be like, this is something that might help a family member remember somebody after they pass away. This might be something that helps mm -hmm. you. Uh, write e write more emails than you'd be able to do otherwise in a single day if it's your personal yeah. assistant. It's, it's, it's always a double-edged sword. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you also to Alyosha and uh, Melanie. I see that there's plenty of questions, so I want to hand it over to, to Shanette again, and she's going to, to, to steer the word and uh, get those uh, questions uh, out there. Thank you so much. Yes, there are some questions about AI systems, possibly AI systems that can detect AI generated text. So for example, from Juan Rodrigo, maybe you want to speak out? The microphone is yours. Uh, maybe we have to allow you. Oh, okay, Sorry. thank you. Yes. 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 Uh, well, Jenny, thanks for having this. So uh, my question was about the methods, well, the the fake uh, tech generation that Dr. Mitchell said on, uh, spoke about on her introduction. So what methods are we using currently in order to try to detect that kind of fake text? Or what measures should be taken uh, in order to check what 
<clears throat> to check that those are fake texts. Um, perhaps uh, one can argue that uh, this kind of text is, or this kind of, um, pardon? Well, it might create, uh, if we use another method, another uh, neural network or another machine learning algorithm, we can might create uh, something like an arms race or something like a, like the GAN, the, the antagonic networks perhaps. Um, Someone else can go first if you have something to say, but I, I don't know if this is for everyone or just. Um... Um, please, if anyone can answer, it'd be okay. Thank you. Should I? I think it's um, Melanie. Yeah, I can. I can say a little bit about that, and maybe Alyosha can also comment. Um, so this idea of, of detecting fake texts, right now, it turns out it's not very hard because especially if there's if the text is relatively long the generated text for, uh, from say gpt3 uh, it tends it's not the longer you go the kind of worse it gets the more it tends to contradict itself or say kind of not so realistic sounding things people can't you know when 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 people were publishing these op-eds written by gpt3 they were uh, running it many different times and picking the best parts of each run. So it was kind of a cherry picking operation. But if you're just um, generating a fake text, I think soon in the future, it's going to get harder and harder to, to detect. Uh, but interestingly, GPT-3 itself can detect text that's been written by GPT-3, because it's able to assign kind of a probability to a given text that would say, what's the probability that it wrote that? So it could be used against itself as a detector. But I think this, this is a big area now of, of, of AI research, which is trying to, as you say, detect fakes. And it's really uh, at its beginning. Alyosha, do you want to comment? Only two sentences. I mean, I like this image of an arms race. I think that's what it is like because I mean, the machines are built to build uh, to to generate text that sound human and that sound plausible. And as Melanie has said, I mean, the devil is in the details. There are there are wrong maybe maybe wrong argumentation traits in there. There are inconsistencies, but on a content level, and the machines have access to the surface. That's exactly the problem, right? I mean, things that we might spot immediately can be for the machine rather opaque that there is something wrong in the argumentation, right? And this is the, the interesting uh, interesting point here. I mean, for humans, it's easy to detect to still today, right? Often, uh, if we read further, then we would soon know, but for the machines, and they are trained exactly to, to, to become better and better with these filters, right? I mean, trying to not outsmart exactly these, the filters you're talking about. So thank you. There is also a very interesting question about the role of the artists uh, from Claudia Garnick. Maybe you want to speak out. The microphone is yours. Claudia, are you still there? Doesn't seem so. So. I'm just looking for her uh, question because I find it very interesting. If computers does not read irony, et cetera, is there probability, probability that only artists are the one who cannot be replaced by technology? Maybe this is for Ross. I don't even know if this one's for me. I, I would actually <laughs> say that I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't be so sure about computers being unable to read irony. I think that there are computer models dating back to the 60s and 70s for um, humor and ideas of how to model human creativity. I mean, Margaret Bowden is a giant in that field who I've been fortunate enough to be on panels like this with actually in Berlin. Um, and, and she, uh, I know, has this model of creativity that's, that's very like well-known read about it if you just google i think her, her paper on that like just the overview is called creativity in a nutshell um i found that really helpful for getting my head around her work um but I, I i guess like when we use labels like irony the problem with talking about those in the context of machine learning as exists now and ai 
and the problem with the term AI is that it's not a term that really is very scientific um, and it's being applied to a field that is scientific. Uh, you know, AI is typically in the past referred to computation that wasn't possible yet. And a lot is possible now in the, in the last five, 10 years that wasn't possible 20 years ago. Um, and so there's sort of this relabeling occurring uh, and, and AI is so accepted at this point, but you know, we may be calling it something different in 10 years uh, due to you know, design realities that shift. Um, I, I, I don't know if we'll be calling it something different, but it may splinter off and do a few different things because really what is, what is happening, I think is this awakening that like AI is not this like human shaped thing necessarily. It's more about everything around us getting smarter. And it's sort of already here in that sense. Um, and to the extent that we ever want like the sort of walking, talking human, um, you know, we might not ever need that uh, in, in its complete form. Um, we might not even want that. Uh, but, but I think that trickles all the way down this discussion in the sense that um, when we talk about a term like irony, that's a human label that was built essentially to the extent that words are built by human culture and a statistical model running on a graphics processing unit or a tensor processing unit you know in the cloud uh doesn't even know what a word is doesn't know what a verb is it learns what these things are from the axioms that the programmer assigns it as well as like some very rudimentary statistical techniques that are essentially done over and over again so we, we can't attribute complex human terminology um, my favorite Dijkstra quote that sort of sums this up which I'll close this very long answer with is um, asking whether a machine can think is like asking whether a submarine can swim so replace the word think with any like human verb that we use asking whether a machine can write asking whether a machine can be creative you know these words were built by humans to apply to human activities and they don't readily apply to something that's kind of like an alien compared to us already. Um, even if it's doing the same thing, it might be going about that process quite differently. Thank you, Ross. And there is another question from, I hope I pronounce it right, Purushit, uh, about also the future and machines talking with machines. Maybe you want to speak out? Is that for me as well? Um, or for someone else? I think maybe also for Melanie and Alyosha, but uh, Purushit, if no, I uh, can answer. answer. Hello. Yeah, hello. So uh, right now we see that GPT-3 can uh, make sensible sentences, but can, how, how long will it take to, for machines to be able to understand other machines as well when they're speaking in human languages? So that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so th that gets to the point of what you mean by understand, because you know, we have machines that communicate with other machines now uh, and are able to um, communicate some kind of meaning that the machines can act on. But in terms of actually understanding in the way that we humans understand, which is sort of being able to tie our language to actual things in the world, machines can't do that yet because they don't learn about the world. They learn about the statistics of language. And this is related to what Ross said, you know, using these terms like, these human terms like understand um, or even communicate is tricky when you're talking about today's machines because they don't do anything like what we do but words like understand, uh, again, are, are, as like Ross said, not scientific. We don't know what it even means in us. So we have to do a lot of work to, uh, to understand our own thinking, our own way of understanding in order to be able to usefully apply those terms to machines. So if it helps, we could say simulate. Right? Can they simulate a dialogue and can they simulate a mutual understanding, right? And this is, I mean, this is possible today that you have two chatbots that talk to each other and it sounds like a somewhat reasonable discourse, right? But yeah, it's, it's a simulation, of course, of a of an, uh, uh, yeah, social interaction. 
But it's, I would just add to that, that, it, that there's a very deep philosophical question of what's the difference between a simulation of thinking and thinking itself. And this sure. is something that philosophers have grappled with for centuries. And Alan Turing, who was one of the pioneers of computation and of AI, tried to deal with in his so-called Turing test, where he said, if something behaves like it's thinking, then it's thinking. But then if we you have read uh, Homo Deus by Harari, I mean, then he basically says the human is a, is a biophysical algorithm, right? I mean, there's no fundamental difference, right? Only the human is a little bit more complex and better trained. Right. So I, I was, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Thinking or understanding is, is kind of a matter of degree rather than a yes or no. It thinks or it doesn't think. We have to talk about degrees. Think about animal children, parrots and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie and Alyosha. And there was one, I guess, very important question about bias in translation and in uh, generated text from Akshit Singh. The microphone is yours if you want to ask. Akshit, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. So the microphone is yours if you want to ask your yeah. question. Thank you. I wanted to ask that, um, like, there's bias in like each and every human. And for example, if someone writes a program or uh, design develops an AI, that that bias towards anything or something, it will be there. It it will be reflected in that program. So how do we eliminate that? Actually, if I may. There is different forms of bias. There is bias in the data, of course, right? I mean, it is it is better than it, it is. Uh, there is bias in the machines because at some point they need to decide. I mean, like us humans, we have also bias, right? At some point you need to decide, is this person good or bad? Maybe if I, if I want to hire you for a job, at some point I decide without, I mean, I, I cannot think about it for ages, yeah? But, but within 30 minutes, from the information I have, then I need to take my decision. And so I need to, yeah, I need to need to use my prejudices and I, I need to take my experience if you formulate more neutrally. But the problem is with the machine learning systems that, that learn from the data that, that they, if you wish, they reveal the, the bias that's in the data, they describe what's going on. If you think of a translation system that translates from English to German and then English, uh, uh, it's called doctor. And in German, you have a, a clearly male form yeah, Arzt instead of the female form, Arztin. And if, if in, the, in the past, doctor has always been translated into the male form, then why, I ask you now, I mean, why should the system start translating it into the female form if it has never been in the data for a data-driven system, right? There would be no, no, no logic. It doesn't have our normative concept that we say, uh, actually, we would like to increase the number of women in uh, practicing in, 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 in medical and other um, industries and other areas. This is our normative concept that the machines don't have. If we wish the machines to behave differently at this point, I mean, one, one option is, for example, to generate um, 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 synthetic data. You can create input sentences where there are female doctors yeah, that are translated or translated into the German female form, and then you can, can put this into the, the, the data, or you have to do some, uh, some pre-processing, but, uh, but then it's, uh, this requires a uh, last sentence. I mean, I, I know time is running out. This reply requires interdisciplinary teams. There, there, there must be data scientists, programmers, but there must also people that know about the, uh, the societal questions. I mean, what is wishful for a society? Yeah, it's not the programmer or that, that feeds some data set in there, not necessarily knows uh, that there is a, an issue about uh, getting more women into, into uh, responsible jobs, right? So, the teams they need to be put together in a right way so that these things are found and eventually uh, uh, then, then uh, uh, held. I think that's an amazing question. I just want to say that's an amazing question. That's like the research question right now that I think everyone in the field is struggling with actually kind of you summed it up very well. Yeah, I, I think that bias, in my opinion, it's not something that we're ever going to solve 100%. Um, because for the reason you specified, it's sort of like there's like a Godel incompleteness theorem around the problem of bias in a way. If you're familiar with Godel, uh, he was a mathematician in the 20th century who sort of like, you know, 
wrote circles around Bertrand Russell and a few other philosophers uh, who thought they'd sort of solved philosophy and math at one point early in the 20th century by proving that like math can't ever be perfect because there's no such thing as perfection really. So that's the one thing that like the roadblock that some researchers are running up against is, in respect to their bias um, is the, that the problem they thought was a problem that can be solved actually only can be solved in theory. So, you know, an example of that would be like, I'm trying to make the perfect sonnet, <laughs> right? Like there's no perfect sonnet. Um, and, and, and we see these differences in the language that like economists use and uh, machine learning scientists or uh, computational scientists use to describe literally the same math. So like what an economist would call a local minima, a computer scientist might call a local optima. And we can see the bias inherent in that language choice that like to a computer scientist, there's always a solution in the space that is like perfection. And, you know, quite literally, and to an economist, uh, it's just sort of like the lowest point on, on the on the chart, uh, and it could mean a lot of different things depending on the causality of the model. So, like modeling is a much like, you know, more, you know, econometrics is a field that is you know sixty five years old, and that was sort of my entry point for deep learning. Um, econometrics, sorry, I'm talking a little too fast. Uh, that's the study in economics of making models and regression analysis, which is used in computer science also. It's basically what helped me wrap my head around neural networks when I was first starting out. Um, if you come from another field, it can be a good entry point because a lot of the math is the same. And if you're interested in statistics, um, machine learning at this point, uh, or, or statistical machine learning, uh, is essentially you know a branch of that mathematics in its most modern incarnation running on all of the most expensive hardware we can build uh, to run it. And that hardware keeps getting more and more complicated in the same way the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency ecosystem continues producing more and more complex hardware. So it's a very like complicated landscape at this point in 2020. So thank you, Ross. I think there is uh, time for Sorry. one <laughs> more long. and one last question. So whoever wants to ask something, Whoever has a question for Melanie, Alyosha, or Ross, just unmute yourself and uh, ask. Nobody? Doesn't seem so. Um, I guess I'll, I'll speak up if nobody else has a question. It's um, kind of a, a big one. So I don't know if there's a straightforward answer to it, but um, especially Melanie, I don't know if you had a, a thought on um, the societal implications. You mentioned that, that fake news was one of the things that people are talking about as a potential implication for these sort of computer systems that can generate large amounts of realistic sounding language. Um, it seems like we have very similar problems with human generated fake news. So is there a reason why similar solutions won't address the issue? So like elevating like known good sources of you know, a good news agency, like giving them more funding to be more present in the public sphere or just increasing public education or would the same solutions not cross apply or is there like a, a specific solution that you think is much better suited to, to computer generated uh, issues like that? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so, so one of the things that's different about machine generated text is that you can scale it up so much more. You can, you know, flood the uh, airwaves, if you will, with uh, all kinds of different generated text that only takes, you know, no amount of time to produce. Now, the solution, I think, as you point out, the, solu the solution is not just a technical solution, but a more societal solution that, ha that incorporates all those things that you mentioned with you know, what, what do we fund? How do we uh, educate people? H how do we uh, communicate about this to people? And I think that people, people in AI often tend to think that there's going to be a technical solution that will solve everything when really we have to, as Alyosha said, involve more interdisciplinary teams that include 
uh, people who study society, who study the, uh, humanity, who, who think about these things much more deeply. So I don't think there's going to be just a technical solution here. So thank you, Melanie, for answering this. I think we have come to an end of the uh, couch lesson. And before we, sorry, before we finish, I want to share with you, or I, I want to draw your attention to our next uh, upcoming couch lessons about AI and music, AI and intimacy, and about AI and reality. Next week, we have three wonderful musicians from Berlin, from LA, and from London, and they uh, will talk about their AI-generated music or their experiments with AI. And uh, I also want to mention another online event uh, presented by the Goethe Institute in London, and they will have a discussion about the future of literary translation and AI with two really good speakers, one Duncan Large from the British Center of Literary Translation and Lucia Spezia from the Imperial College in London. And if you want to get further details, just visit the uh, homepage of the Goethe Institute in London. That's all from my side. And I uh, hope that you enjoyed our couch lesson. And um, I hope that you will join us again next week and uh, tell your friends about the couch lesson and spread the word and uh, yeah, share our events uh, online. Have a nice evening, have a nice day, whatever comes. And thank you for joining us.